So another day, another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. And I'm very glad to be joined today by Flavio Azevedo. <laughs> Please. Okay, we talked about this before. So you're Brazilian <laughs> and also a co-founder and um, the director of FORT, which is an acronym um, for Framework for Open and Reprodu Reproducible Research Training. And we have crossed paths several times and keep crossing um, and meeting in various events around open science, open practices, um, reproducible research, um, as trainers, as facilitators, as creators of um, learning materials or educational materials for these purposes. Um, so, um, but yeah, let's hear from you. Um, what's your background? And um, also, very warm welcome. <laughs> um, Thank you. And um, yeah, let's hear from you. So what's your background as in, um, yeah university studies research and how did you get, get involved um or... in science and what made you dedicate so much of your life to for it um so i think let, let well i'll start with the beginning um so i'm brazilian um i migrated to um and lived in 11 different countries um i had uh, before I started studying at 26, I had um, the kind of jobs you would expect for, for people. I was a waiter, I was a cook, I uh, built houses, I, I worked in all sorts of jobs, and um, well, all with the lofty ideal that one day I would have enough money to start studying. And at the age of 26, I um, had enough. Um, um, funders funding to you know uh, have a, a very humble student life and started studying psychology at the University of Coimbra in Portugal and I was lucky to be given several other opportunities um, uh, after that and um, studied human rights and discrimination study uh, stats uh, political science and ended up doing a PhD in political science and did some postdocs in in social psychology, and now, thankfully, I can stress how happy this is. But um, I'm an, an, a new assistant professor uh, in social psychology at the University of Groningen, um, oh, which is congratulations. Thank you. It's a <laughs> tenure track, no less. So I'm wow. I'm so so excited and um, feel very fulfilled. My my partner also um, um, got an assistant professorship at Leiden University as well. So mm -hmm. we moved here and um, uh, to the Netherlands and we're trying to figure out the distance. But other than that, you know, my life became a dream. So after so many years fighting for it and um, I'm now, <laughs> I won't, I won't divulge that kind of information because, but I'm, I'm very old. But after <laughs> you know so many years on the road, it feels nice to finally find a place where experience I can and um and with experience, there's a lot to share with others to make their path easier along the way. So it's I don't know. Job. I'm tr I'm trying. I'm learning to embrace my age. I also read an article recently where they were saying, "Why are we hiding our age? Like let's be, let's embrace it. Let's be proud of it, as long as we are alive and kicking and can move reasonably." Well, let's just be grateful for the years we're counting. Um, but anyways, I'm not gonna push you. <laughs> um, and congratulations, it's like really quite an accomplishment. Can you, from the top of your head, list all these 11 countries you've lived in? Oh, so I lived in, well, Brazil, uh, and in Brazil I lived in quite a few places, but most known to most people would be Rio and Sao Paulo. I moved a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, uh, I also lived in Argentina and Chile uh, when I was a child. Um, um, then I lived uh, in the U.S. in Park City um, as well as L.A. I lived in um, Spain, Portugal, then France, then 
um, Italy oh. than the Netherlands, that I'll Germany. Chronolog chronologically, yeah. wait for the Germany, U because I know you lived here as well at some point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I lived in Aachen as well as Jena. Okay. Beautiful cities. I'm very fond of both. But Jena did steal my heart because of the whole tracking and nature and i mm -hmm. i really love my time in germany then uk and now burn again was that 11 i think probably I think I no, who's counting yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, age of our countries but yeah. well i may have missed one but i think researchers tend to be nomads nonetheless but it's also some of us who dedicate our life to research who are maybe nomads before we really turn into researchers like I knew yeah. when I committed myself to study biology, I knew that it would come with a lot of traveling and moving around places. And I didn't mind until I hit maybe the mid thirties. Um was like, oh, maybe it's good to settle at some point. Get some ease. <laughs> like, but but then, yeah. like I can't I can't do either. Like uh, anyway, so I, I wouldn't want to miss anything from those experiences having lived in and probably gonna live in other countries also in the future but it's a it's a way of living i guess some are more yeah. so others are more nomadic we are of the nomadic species okay i think i think i needed to um interest i was motivated to find myself and I think exposing yourself to different cultures, different environments, different friends, different, you know, everything. You sort of more in contact with yourself. I think that that was on a personal level, how I thought of it. And um, with that said, at the end side of this, and especially in the last, I would say four or five years where I was post-docking, um, I really longed for um, for a home, a place, more stability. You know, the, the experience for sure is, you know, edifying, taught me a lot, made me, um, you know, it's a humbling experience, but um, I, I'm, I'm glad I found a place. Mm, yeah, I bet. Well, yeah, with a secure position, which is hard to find these days in academia, it like makes it easier to settle down to some degree, but it's like I yeah, it's like the security and the consistency. I think is something that I also appreciate, and yet I feel like always itchy to travel again after some time. But then it doesn't have to be a full move, maybe anymore at this age, like mine. Referring yeah. to mine only. <laughs> yeah, I think in my plans is to you know go to conferences more and maybe workshops and give it's it's a position of privilege extreme privilege in a very privileged country and environment and i hope to um use this position and the powers that come with it to elevate the voices of others and maybe educate um train people in in less fortunate environments mm. and traveling to these environments is part of this yeah so um for it how did that come about like what was the trigger to yeah to sit down with the other co-founder and probably a team of early adopters to to set for up and bring it into into the academic ecosystem yeah so um and it was uh, um was between quotes an accident. Um, we were uh, at the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science, which is this very different um, innovative conference with very much the right people to uh, you know affect change. And um, it was in 2018, so you know we already were aware of you know the ripple ability crisis, the credibility revolution, and et cetera. But it was very early on. And um, at a time, um, the open education, open education as part of open science within academia, this is super important to emphasize because librarians, as, as you know, have been thinking about what 
you know, on this topics forever. Mm. But in academia, it was very much, um, um, at least to our knowledge, uh, it was very much uh, a neglected topic. And we were in this workshop, better, better framed as hackathon, where just people get together and try to generate new ideas and, and new actions, right? Very, very action prone. And we, um, we found one another, Sam Parsons and I, uh, that shared the same ideas that you know, we need to talk more about open education, we need to democ democratize learning, um, we need to unburden educators um, and help them, um, you know, we can just say, hey, um, here's yet another thing that you need to do, open science in this case, on your research, but also in your teaching, right? So we thought that uh, we needed an organization that could be educationally um, uh, focused and whose principal goal at a time was to unburden educators and trainers and everyone, you know, just trying to set new norms and trying to, um, um, you know, push the, the cart forward. Um, and later on, very early on though, uh, it became clear that on top of the open education part, we needed to also push the diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility part as well as an integral part of open science, which then led us to reformulate some of our arguments and some of our missions and even identify ourselves instead of open science, but with open scholarship, which is a far larger, uh, broader umbrella. And that's, that's the origin story. I, I hope that wasn't too boring. No, not at all. And it's also a beautiful example of how organizations um, come to existence through events like hackathons, where you know where where you have an opportunity to meet, and also to all the listeners out there, like use these opportunities. And they might seem a bit casual, but it's in the casual atmosphere and circumstances that great initiatives get started usually. Um, yeah. And this is just one one key example of such an an important resource and organization to foster open science. And promote. Thank you. I just want to give a shout out to to Zips, the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science, because it was literally the cradle for so many great initiatives, and it still works relentlessly to support. A lot of initiatives and it, it, it doesn't care for example i was in political science nobody ever asked me oh are you a psychologist because we can't help you sort of thing um they they helped nonetheless it's it's just a great community and with great people and with the i would say the right mindset and every time i talk about the origins of board i i just want to communicate how grateful we are that you know people actually made the effort to to make this conference uh, it was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and and you know, there's so many there's so many great initiatives by by Zips that mm. you know, Ford is just one of them. Yeah, I heard that also. Igdor is an organization I'm also a member of, the Institute for Globally. I have to look that up again. Globally, the diverse, um, open. Well, basically, what I'm trying to say is that also Igdor is born out of. Um, Sips. So um, Rebecca, Elian, the Institute for Globally Distributed Open Research and Education. Um, and Rebecca Elian, who's the founder and director, is also a psychologist. Um, so yeah, I come from a biology angle, so um, I learned about Sips and the initiatives that come from that rather late. So it's it's it turns out that as as connected we all are in the open science um communities um we we still keep growing together and we still keep i think it's also it's like evolution goes like it's just another ecosystem we're looking at with um providing learning materials and opportunities and networks for open science practices coming from different origins and directions um, and it's exciting to see how yeah, to learn about seemingly new initiatives, but they've been around for for quite a while. 
nonetheless, just that we all, each live in our own bubbles. But I've followed Ford for several years now. Um, and okay, so let's let's go a little bit into okay, what what does Ford do? So it's basically by his name, framework for open reproducible research training. So you deliver trainings and you develop training materials for the adoption of open science practices. Um, uh, yeah, would you, would you, could you share a little bit more, like, or give a few, or one or two examples of how, how this would then look like? And I also want to, um, what I'm really, what's really useful and also has been developed um, quite a few in different um, places is the glossary, but I feel like the board glossary is like the most coherent that I've seen thus far. It's quite quite something to, to learn and familiarize ourselves with the terms that rotate around open science and reproducible research. Okay, but over to you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, please do stop me because your question is very broad. So I, I can already mm -hmm. foresee that I'll talk for a little bit. So oh, feel free to. That's, that's the whole point. It's your state. All right. So, um, so Ford basically is an interdisciplinary community. We're more or less 750 people plus um, of mostly early career scholars that are trying to integrate open scholarship principles into higher education. And we do so with the goals or the lofty goals, I should say, of research transparency, uh, reproducibility, rigor, and ethics through pedagogical reform and meta science. So that's what we do, right? So we try to, you know, talk about research integrity, reproducibility, rigor, ethics, um, and, and we do so, uh, uh, um, you know, by, analyzing meta-scientific questions like the, the literature, um, but also providing educational resources and advocating for a different way to look at um, open education and how we train our students uh, in, in higher education so that we can um, train them to be better consumers of science. I think that's fundamental to Ford um, in train them on epistemic plurality, epistemic uncertainty, um, all that good stuff, um, so that when they're, between quotes, finally free uh, after their bachelors or they proceed to do to something else, at least they can, in their lives, do um, and, and have a, an engagement with science that uh, is meaningful. And, and, and even in 10 years, they can, you know, uh, in a society with a lot of misinformation, conspiracy theories, etc., cetera, um, it can be difficult to distinguish truth from something else. And uh, essentially we argue that reform of how we educate our students, no matter what, if we're talking about history or if we're talking about, uh, I don't know, psychology, um, uh, open science principles should be uh, more integrated for several different reasons, right? Um, so that's mainly what we do or, or, or the reasons why we do it. Now, when it comes to what for does, we have two major branches. One is advocacy that I'll talk to you in a bit. Um, and the majority of our work is to leverage big team science approaches to produce educational resources to unburden um, um, educators or trainers um, and learners of open science. So for example, if you go on our website, mm -hmm. there is an educational nexus. It's one of the pages where we essentially have, I think uh, around 15 educational initiatives. So we have, for example, we came together and through our consensus base, a community-based effort, we sort of cluster the open science literature across several different fields into clusters. Mm. So to organize it, and we also provide a syllabi, um, we also provide 200 summaries of open scholarship with the goal, not that you don't need to read papers, but it's more like you wanna cycle through more knowledge faster, right? Um, 
and, and there is also the barrier that, you know, in the global south and low and middle income countries, uh, they, uh, it's not always that they have access to paid wall articles, and it's our hope that at least they have the gist of the article. Not that that is a solution in any shape or form, but at least that uh, there is some there's some initiatives trying to make things open as well. So you know, it's uh, looking at this multidimensionally, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, produce lesson plans, meaning that if you want to teach, say, about um topics such as um uh how not to be cynical or register reports or neurodiversity um inclusion um what is the difference between correlation and causation uh, you know qualitative research etc so all these topics there are lesson plans mm -hmm. that helps the educator um you know just guide them we also developed a glossary of open scholarship terms okay. with uh, 250 terms and where like 120 people approximately came together. And also through consensus, we, we are firm believers on that community side of things that together we can, we can help uh, better, right? Um, not only one another, but also the community at large. And we defined several terms which are freely accessible. Uh, to everyone anywhere. And uh, now, um, as some of the port uh, projects, um, like uh, replications of reversals, and uh, the glossary is a dynamic uh, initiative. And that means that um, we are constantly trying to uh, update it and improve it. So we are currently on phase two. So we have published a paper on it. We have released our first glossary and now we are expanding from 250 terms to 300 to i'm sorry with more 350 terms for a total of 700 and we're all it's awesome right oh. um <laughs> and we're also translating it into uh 10 different languages are you serious oh uh, yeah I... yeah <laughs> and and there is if you're interested there is a german team um, um, they are translating the, their original 250 terms uh, for oh. sure. Mm. Um, and so this is a dynamic project. Uh, now that uh, we are a system, uh, I am an assistant professor, but we also have other uh, folks from Fort community that uh, you know are becoming uh, professors or also applying for grants um, so that we can pay the community for their work because Fort up to now has been exclusively a volunteer-based organization. So everything you see, the, the website, um, which I believe it looks a paid initiative. It's pretty um, impressive and pretty resourceful. That's And that feels still like an understatement. Thank you. And <laughs> yes, we're thinking about applying for grants and how that goes. We're learning out, you know, the ropes. So that is the glossary, but you know, uh, another, there's so many initiatives, so I, I, I hope I don't miss them, but there's another one, which is uh, replications and reversals. And essentially we figured out that um, there isn't support for neither researchers nor teachers and educators to know if what they are teaching or what they are researching uh, has been or not replicated. There has been some uh, lists and you know, uh, collations of verifications, but more at the individual level. And there was one who had a lot of promise um, um, that didn't work out, let's say that. Um, so Ford took on its community to provide uh, effects based uh, um, uh, collection of replications. And now it comes with, I think, 400 replication types. And for each replication we cite, uh, we we sort of list, you know, the original paper, it's DOI, um, it's sample size, effect size. There's a lot of work. It's not just a list, you know. Mm -hmm. We also provide a qualitative judgment based on the available literature or whether, you know, it's replicated, it's uh, likely no result or a mixed result or mm -hmm. a reversal. And a reversal means that the uh, as compared to the original work, the replication sort of find the opposite effect of the theorized effect. So if, um, I don't know, uh, 
uh, if a, a relationship between A and B was theorized originally as being positive related replications found a negative relationship. So that's the reversal fancy name that we give uh, to that initiative. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a team devoted entirely to advocating for um, neurodiversity um, and the connection between the neurodiversity movement and the open scholarship movement, um, um, you know, that advocates for the inclusion of uh, both diversity of people, but also neurodiversity and inclusion of uh, neurodiverse folks into academia. Can I, um, this can, can I hold, like take you up on this? I know that you have a lot to share. Um, and uh, we have a well, I have a section on our website was on my training materials at Access to Perspectives for uh, well being, which to quite an extent refers to mental well being in academia, which has proven to be quite a serious game or serious uh, concernful for many initiatives to also be born to focus on that specifically. Um, and I've I've also come out in this podcast a while ago, so several episodes ago, of having dealt with and probably continued to deal with depression. And like in working through that with and for myself, I've come to to terms with myself that it's not well, it's a like the depressive state is a symptom of a sensitive mind, which I very much appreciate to be quite sensitive um, as a human being. Um, and it's just a matter of, I, I believe it's, it's a matter of finding the right environment and getting the supportive network to be able to flourish despite and with, not despite, but with the sensitivity. And that's because I've come across, what's her name, Elaine something, with a highly sensitive personality um, definition where she says, I think Elaine Aaron, I have to look that up, um, where she said that roughly 20% of all humans around the world have that trait. And that's quite useful also in a society or in any community to have people with different mindsets or different character traits and sensitivities. And each has their role in a group of individuals like as in a social okay so i'm i'm going so deep also on my personal experiences because i'd like to learn now from you can you in a nutshell what is neurodiversity and is that going in a similar direction appreciating that people are different and it's not necessary it's Historically, in Western society, it's been labeled as a disease or a deficiency, but is it really? But it's not that we have to solve this here and now, but like what, what does the neurodiversity movement try to achieve? And yeah, so just to, to hear from you. And that's okay, where so we're just headed. So sorry for interrupting that. I needed to give you that stage. It is, it, listen, it's so very important to include uh, people's narratives on to explaining something. So I, I really thank you for your comment um, and also sharing and uh, because it plays into neurodiversity for sure. Um, so neurodiversity is just natural variations in the human brain that have consequences for you know several functions such as motivation, um, uh, such as sociability and uh, a, a huge aspect of areas. Uh, that's what neurodiversity is. And I think you mentioned something that is really important that the neurodiversity movement tries to do, which is to move away from the pathology, the disorder um, uh, sort of framework or perspective and sort of accepting that diversity um, um, as part of just nature, right? So moving away from 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 a very dogmatic, um, exclusionary perspective of disease or pathology or disorder. Mm. Um, 
I should say that I am uh, neurodiverse myself. I'm dyslexic and uh, ADHD, um, but I in no way, shape, or form speak for the movement, which itself is very rich and uh, in development, similar to open scholarship. Um, as a matter of fact, I would say that the open scholarship movement and the neurodiversity movement, they share a lot together and we wrote a paper called Bridging Neurodiversity and Open Scholarship. Uh, you can find that on our publications website, mm -hmm. um, on our publications page in our Ford website. And um, there we essentially talk about the similarities and differences between the movement and what it entails. How, for example, uh, neurodiverse uh, people have a tendency to feel excluded uh, given that academia is an ivory tower and, you know, overwhelmingly made up uh, of white male cisgender, heterosexual and non-disabled people. So um, it is, it is, in, in, it was inquiring about this sort of, you know, privileges that we often neglect in our day-to-day -day research, teaching, educational activities that we wanted to write this article. And uh, this is just, you know, this is sort of the manifesto from this neurodiversity team within, inside Ford, but um, we have also uh, done research on uh, or, or published or advocated for uh, neurodiversity in academia in different ways, in different outlets. We wrote a piece for APS. Uh, we wrote uh, a paper on participatory research uh, and neurodiversity, et cetera. So it's a really um, prolific group uh, that, you know, just tries to avoid this ableist perspective um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to how, you know, the norms in academia are, um, are the way that they are, and we are trying to challenge them. Mm. And, um, that's it. Was that helpful? Very much so. Yeah. Pushing boundaries, um, or I think more than that, disrupting the status quo. It's also like when I hear um, people complain about the system is broken, I've come to realize that even, like we are, and anyone in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, and above, we are the system. We're, we're in charge now. And it, I don't think everything is broken. But there's a lot to be optimized um, because history keeps playing its game and it's and it's too easy to settle on a status quo. But uh, institutions, individuals like yourself, institutions like Ford are here to widen the scope and horizon and to challenge the status quo. And also like it's like we're in charge in doing so. So it's it's sort of, I feel it's sort of our responsibility. And I think, I don't know, from, speaking for myself, and then I would like to ask you if you feel the same way. It's it's a lot of work, but I wouldn't want, I, I couldn't do it any other way. Um, because it's also, I don't know, people call it a calling or a purpose. Or like I feel purposeful in doing that kind of work. And it's important. And again, we are in charge. We are responsible. So whatever we don't like, we can change. We're here. And we have certain privileges, certain positions, certain like platforms to let our voices be heard and um, open rooms and platforms for others to be heard. It's just, uh, I think it comes down to being a decent human being on the planet, on this, on this, uh, on this planet. Um, but also taking charge. And I think it's also okay for people to decide how much charge they want to take and like not to judge anybody who's not running their own organization of such an um such a scope like Ford does. Um everybody's doing their their part and um often also on the personal space, not so much in a professional space, and that's equally important. Oh, okay. So just trying to get away from the um, misconception of, of my speech, <laughs> where was that? But do you feel similarly, like what, what's your driving motivation for, for 
being the director of Ford and for doing the kind of work that you do? So Ford is definitely my lifeline to academia. Um, I, it is really a surprise that I, you know, that in the past couple months or so, I've been given this amazing opportunity, but for many years, I never thought that this would, you know, become a reality. Um, not only because of my different parkour or my age uh, or other, you know, you're always the immigrant. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of barriers and I hold myself privileged. I'm white looking, um, I'm a man. Um, and, you know, even with these enormous privileges, it, it, it can be hard um, how to learn to communicate uh, what is uh, the nuances of communication at as you rise up up on the the echelons of society mm. right how certain norms that you have when you, within your own culture changes as you move countries for sure but also the layers within countries of you know the socioeconomic statuses so um, you know all this to say is that um, it is it is an enormous privilege to be around that community. I've learned so much, and it was for many many years of my life the best thing about academia. Mm. So I think that my motivation, in many ways, was very selfish because. I learned more with them than with er, er, elsewhere. Um, and I learned with this community, not only how to be a better researcher and, but also a better human being. And um, it is the most intense uh, and beautiful experience of my life. Mm. Yeah, I feel similarly with Africa Aka, which is a lot of work, but also such a steep learning curve on so many levels um yeah so yeah i i can see i think <laughs> um as much as uh i i can see parallels in our journeys all right um so what's next within fort i mean we've heard what's next for you you're settling in your your professorship or assistant professorship for the time being um, and what's next with Ford? Do you think you'll be able time-wise to continue to with the extent or are you preparing to delegate some of your um, responsibilities to other team members or I don't know, without going into too much detail, it's quite an in, yeah, quite an interrogative question to ask, but but what's next with you and Ford to put it more in a on a meta meta level as a question. Yeah. So something I left out or that I shouldn't have is that Ford is really, really a big community. And um I only do the sort of tying at the you know um and putting all together in several ways, but essentially um there's leads for each of these projects, right? Uh, and they are not only extremely independent, a lot of what is in there, it's their work. Mm. And um, I have a, um, a role to facilitate the projects that they envision as, as you know, that, as, that needs to be done in many ways. And as long as it fits with uh, the ethos of Ford, as I mentioned, very, uh, you know, open scholarship with... Uh, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, then it's it should be fine. We have a, a a team called Team Ideas, and people go there on Slack and propose ideas, and they are able to start their own board initiatives as long as they lead, they receive training and um, how to communicate, etc., uh, with folks. Um, so because it's a volunteer organization, and that you know, not that non-volunteer organizations don't need that kind of training, but it's especially relevant mm. when everybody's just donating their time, right? Um, so the, the reason why I mentioned that is that 
you know, technically I don't delegate things to people. They, uh, not, it's just because I'm not sure I, I, I do that much. Um, but I do devote a lot of time in community building meetings, mm. hackathons, trainings, and etc. So, um, but what is what is in the future for Ford is um, we're we're going to continue to uh, advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and ever more trying to embed words that are not synonyms together. So robustness with diversity inclusion with gender visibility, um, research integrity with ethics. And so that's that that's the plan. It's to make these things undissociable, unseparable, and make the open scholarship movement recognize, um, hopefully, <laughs> uh, sometimes we call it open science 2.0, um, mm -hmm. recognize the need for uh, this uh this non-separation mm. well you're touching on something because i've been wondering for the longest time how research integrity is different from ethics acknowledging that each kind of um, branch out into different spheres on their own but i i agree i mean um, there must be i mean there must be a, a big overlap but then when you look into what's out there on research integrity some universities, some um, initiatives target quite technically, talk about it quite technically, and leaving out the whole ethical and human aspect of it. And I, I agree, like, it, it cannot be without the ethics. I mean, it shouldn't be. Of course it can, but <laughs> unfortunately, and that's when things go, in my view, down the drain. And that's when we compromise animal rights or human rights also. Um, within research and academic practices. But it is important. I think this is also something that the open science movement has brought to light that we need to give it a more humane touch again, the whole scholarly um, workflow in, in any discipline, really. Like again, like I am coming from the natural sciences and it seem, yeah, seems to be stripped of anything or much of the the ethics part. And the ethics discussion um, are often mini like minimized to getting an ethics approval to do to be able to do experiments with certain animals. And that's it. But not to ask the questions of why and what's the purpose? How can this be implemented? Just because we can do certain um experiments doesn't mean that we have to. But <laughs> So I think this is also a conversation that's been quite lively and probably especially after the Second World War. Like when I was talking to my mother and her generation of researchers. Um, and I feel this has gone missing in the past couple of decades or three. Um, the question of purpose for research. And not saying that there's none out there. There's a lot of purpose-oriented research happening, but what we see being published often gets stuck in the publishing pipeline, which seems to be cluttered on the, on the journal level. So how can we see research finding its way to societal impact? Um, but that's something that's, that I'm yeah, focusing on. And, it's, and I think, like, I see a lot of that also in Ford's mission and vision. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think you, you touched upon so many things there, Joe, that I'm uncertain if I can provide. No, I'm not expected to provide anything. This is a, an ongoing process yeah. for all open scholarship movement or whatever it is. Some it people is say, discussion. oh, it's not a movement, but it's happening. I mean, and, yeah. It is a movement. It is a social movement for sure. As yeah, um, I think so. Um, as a as somebody who published on the area, I I I I think it's a social movement. Um, it's you know people trying to affect change. Um, there's an organization. There's uh, there's different views. There's uh, live conversations. Um, it might be um, 
uh, most it might it, it might involve a lot of academics, but not only academics. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of you know uh, called uh, community science, right? Between quote citizen science, but to be more inclusive, uh, community science um, involved. There is um, you know there's private stakeholders. There is intergovernmental um, um, uh, bodies like NASA and UNESCO who are now joining um, this existing grassroots open scholarship movement. So it is, I would say that it's not only a social movement, but a global one. Yeah, movement and reform and transition. Just, yeah, to, I mean, we're, there's also an urgency, obviously, let alone climate yeah. change and many others, but climate change is probably the most immediate threat we're facing as a, not only us as humans, but with everyone along, <laughs> like all yeah. the other creatures with us. So, Wow, that's a high note to end the conversation on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so. The I think so. Is on. Let's get Ford into action. Well, Ford is very much in action, and let's get the word out. Are you are you open to um to onboard new volunteers and team members? Absolutely, I yes. It's an open organization. From the website, you can enter the Slack, and there is a manual of onboarding. Uh, people can read, but, you know, just introduce yourself on our Slack and mm -hmm. um, anyone who might be listening. And um, we we try to be very welcoming of everybody. And some folks say, oh, I need help with this. Some folks say, oh, I just want to help. Let me know what I can do. Other mm -hmm. folks uh, are lurkers. They're just there. <laughs> and that's awesome. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's awesome to provide a community that people, you know, <laughs> how can I put this? install slack on their phone or their computer uh just to be aware of what we're doing it's, yeah. it's an immense it's an immense gift mm. yeah and then they probably take the message further in other channels and yeah it's also a way to to contribute excellent yeah. so everyone head over to the forward web website it's f o double r oh, two r's t dot org <laughs> Um, and it's been a great pleasure. We could also mention, if you um, approve, that the mentioned paper, the article that um, that you guys wrote around neurodiversity and open scholarship um, has in it a resource which is finding its own way in disrupting a system, um, which is the academic wheel of privileges. And um, yeah, hopefully very soon. So that's basically a cliffhanger for this conversation. We hear more from you, not only you or and or your colleagues who were um, busy in putting that project together. And it's it's also being revised. We will add it to the resource list and in the show notes and the blog post that comes with this recording. So you can already look at it and then hear more from from, from you, Flavio, and your colleagues on how this came about. It will be a pleasure. Thank you, Joe, for inviting me. It's very kind of you, and I look forward to talking to you again. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining, and yeah, speak to you soon. Mm -hmm.